All right, what is up, punks? Uh, Shinobi, and we are bringing you a very packed uh, special edition of the Digest on Friday, June 26th. So, uh, yeah, uh, today we got Janine, uh, Mr. Chris Ellis joining us, as well as uh, Nothing Much, Nopara, and Isfan, who collaborated on the recent Wabi Sabi proposal. So, um Begin the disorganized mess of saying hello. 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 Hey. Hey, guys. It's interesting to be on the other side, on the guest side, and not on the host side here. So, yeah. Do, 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 do. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, uh, we're here to really talk about Wabi Sabi today. And, uh, yeah, I thought kind of a good place to start would just be buzzing through Zero Link itself. <clears throat> because, you know, at least the way I'm looking at it, Wabi Sabi is kind of both a change to the coin join structure, like the transaction, but there's also a tweak that it makes to the Zero Link framework um, as far as coordinating that transaction. So, I don't know, Para. Uh, as the inventor, you want to run us through just a quick TLDR on uh, Zero Link, and then we can start getting into the changes this would make to it. Sure. Um, it's um, it's an interesting thing because in Zero Link, I I came up with that, and it it was just a specification. But in contrast, Wabi Sabi is, is an actual research and uh, we could incorporate a bunch of things into Wabi Sabi that, uh, that I, just, I just didn't have time to figure out at, at that time. Uh, for example, having much better dose protection um, algorithms and, 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 and a bunch of stability things. So, so, so Wabi Sabi is just... Uh, much more uh we just we just figured out things uh, in a much more stable way than what i did back then in 2017 so that's that that could be kind of the historic difference i don't think we should go into the protocol just yet um <laughs> but uh but but one thing that i still like to mention that wabi sabi is just um so if you think about the research, it's only one third ready. And right now we are working on the second third of the research. And the first third was the the most difficult part because that was the cryptographic thingy that that uh, that is fun and nothing much. And I, I can't I can't say me because they are so much smarter than me. Istvan is a cryptographer. Nothing much is is someone who I always thought he's mumbling around and doesn't make sense, but writing words very fast. And now that working with him, I I just realized that now he's actually like like he really thought about everything and he's always ten steps ahead of everyone else. And actually, what he's saying makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so 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 anyway, the thing is that they they came up mostly with the cryptographic protocol part, which is, uh, which is something that I didn't know it's even possible that uh, how can we... The basic problem is how can we register inputs and outputs to coin joins in a way that, uh, that no party learns um, the, the any, any any input input links, any output output links, and any input output links, uh, and not using standard amounts. And I didn't think it's possible with 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 some cryptography, but but they figured this out, and 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 this is the basis of 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 the whole research that we are we are going into right now. Yeah, and so like that. Um mechanism like the 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 range proof use and the the kvac system that's pretty much like the major change happening in zero link here because 
like prior to this, like the, the registration proofs for outputs were just statically linked to an amount and an output and you couldn't really compose them a lot. So like that change to zero link is not just also the, the facilitation mechanism being changed, but enabling um, changes to the actual transaction structure too. So like, uh, I guess nothing much or is fun. Do uh, you guys want to kind of dive a little bit into that uh, and try to keep kind of a high level? I think it's, Which one? Which one? I think as an <laughs> analogy, one can just think of zero link as Nokia 3310. And I don't know, uh, pick your favorite phone. Uh, and that's Wabi Sabi. So that's the too long didn't read uh, version of, of our research. How, how can we upgrade from a Nokia 3310 to some modern uh, smartphone? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a little, a little too high level. I mean, like, as a, um, as a person who uh, prefers dumb phones, why would I want to upgrade? <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought the 3210 was a better phone, better handset. Because of privacy reasons. <laughs> or all right, trolls. Uh, but let's 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 get more specific with the question. Um, <clears throat> like, how how does this new mechanism actually facilitate, um, like, kind of decoupling that ability to register something from a specific UTXO with a specific predetermined value? So blind signatures. Uh allow you to get a signature from the server when you register an input that you can then present to the server uh, at the output registration phase in order to authorize the uh, output registration. But it only conveys like one bit of information. The server can say, is this a valid signature from that key? If it is, it just knows that it signed the message before, but it doesn't know which message it was that it was signing because when it provided the signature, the message was blinded. And what the uh, Wabi Sabi stuff does is it uses uh, anonymous credentials, which are kind of uh, a generalization of that idea, uh, which uh, allows these kind of uh, blind signature type things to have uh, attributes. So. Uh, in these attributes, uh, we're storing the amount uh, homomorphically uh, uh, committed. So, like, it's a bit like confidential transactions, but in like at the bottom line, it just means that um, instead of just having a single signature um, for a, a denomination you get a credential that represents uh, an arbitrary amount and you can combine those or you can split those. Um, I think it could make sense to forget everything that, that you know, and introduce the problem from, from zero on that, um, that how do you, how do you do coin joins with other people without anyone losing privacy? And that would be very, very simple. Uh, people submit their inputs uh, from different Tor circuits and people submit their outputs from different Tor circuits. Now the problem is that Tor makes this anonymous. So you cannot, you cannot tell who provided more outputs than how many inputs they provided. So that's the, that's the big problem here. Somehow you have to ensure that the balance that every user provided exactly as many inputs, as many outputs they provided, but you cannot know the link between users' inputs and outputs. And this is this is what uh, Zero Link was solving in a way that, well, if every single in output uh, submission is a standard amount, then we can just use blind signatures to, to fix this problem. But uh, there are many schemes like the knapsack mixing from 2017 that does not use um, equal amounts, but it is using, uh, it is trying to optimize for the maximum uh, number of subsets. Uh, anyway, the thing is, it does not use equal amounts. And, and we didn't know how to trustlessly construct that kind of coin joins, or we didn't know how to trustlessly construct uh, 
shared coin, old blockchain info, shared coin like coin joins, or 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 the cash fusion like coin joins. So we just we just didn't have a way to do that uh, because the amounts can can differ, and uh, and that's what was Bobby Sobi tries to solve in in part one of the research. Yeah, and so it's like mostly um, kind of solving that problem, you know, at the core, uh, applying range proofs, right? So that you can kind of decompose a single input into the arbitrary values that you're trying to enable here. Yeah, um, so when you bring in an input, the input amount is known because it's public, it's on the blockchain. Um, what you do is you request several credentials and you prove to the coordinator that uh, the different amounts inside of the attributes of these credentials, uh, which are hidden, there's one amount attribute per credential. Uh, so you prove that these amounts are not negative numbers, because if you could request a negative number, then um, you could just never submit it and some other credential would uh, have um, the uh, the difference represented as an amount greater than what you submitted. So you need to prove that everything is a positive integer. Uh, and um, you prove that the sum of all of the uh, amounts you requested is the same as uh, what you showed the the coordinator. Yeah, and so you can kind of take that original um, zero link spec, which is locked into these predefined denominations and completely generalize that now. Now, you know, there's, you know, if, if my understanding is clear, like you guys are still kind of working through and debating the actual transaction structure um, in terms of the, the anonymity set, um, the input output mapping that this enables. But you know, one of the first things before getting into that, I see this as potentially addressing is um, change handling. Like you would still potentially run into liquidity issues um, in trying to do something like this. But having a generalized composable credential that you could pass around opens the possibility of um, multiple persons change outputs being combined into a single one. Um, which is something that's still going to maintain linkability to the inputs um, based on the, the logic of CoinJoin. And so even without getting into enabling different types of transaction structures with different anonymity properties, this is opening the door to a better handling of that, that those change outputs that don't actually receive the anonymity set benefit. It's, it's not that easy to to de-anonymize shared coin like coin joins, which are just somewhat very, very naive coin joins without trying to solve the, uh, the amount equality stuff. Uh, it turns out in practice, it's, it's not only not easy, but it's, it's close to impossible because the algorithm that, that runs it, uh, it just never finishes to, so, so never never able to to figure that out unless some very sophisticated assumptions and and in fact even the shared coin uh, you might you guys might have heard about the coin join sudoku research and when we looked into that uh, it turns out it was never published i mean it was published as an advisory but what algorithm was used uh, the code was never published and even the the explanation uh, was not uh, was not correct. So the so so so, so we cannot we cannot say that anyone de-anonymized the old shared coin style transactions. Contrary to popular be belief, that it was completely broken. So that's that's an interesting note there. Uh, why we are not really consolidating change in Wasabi right now is because. You can only consolidate change by exposing the links between inputs and uh, to the coordinator, and we we want to do that very 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 carefully. But uh, but if Wabi Sabi comes uh, 
to play, then then you don't need to be that careful anymore with that. I have to kind of disagree there a little bit. So um, the partition problem or the subset sub problem uh, is NP hard in the general case. Uh, so it takes an exponential amount of time in the input size to uh, solve it for uh, any arbitrary uh, combination. But in special cases, it's often the case that it is uh, solvable efficiently. Um, this is why the uh, knapsack um, crypto cryptographic system, the first public key system, uh, turned out to be insecure. Uh, it's because you need to actually select a specific uh, like knapsack problem that's uh, uh, also a related um, combinatorial problem, which is actually uh, difficult to solve. Um, but there's another nuance there that I think is is also often missed in uh, discussions about this in the, in the context of coin joins. There's the computational difficulty on the one hand, but also uh, on the other, if you have more than one solution, even if you can solve it efficiently, you don't know which is the right solution. And I think that that's a distinction that's uh, that was lacking in shared in shared coin. Oftentimes, there was only one solution. And then in some cases, it was efficient to um, solve it. Um, and in the case of uh, Wasabi, um, I, I do have like uh, somewhat unfinished code uh, for mixed integer programming that um, that's like a, a, a way of using uh, solvers that uh, use various heuristics and, and uh, techniques from mathematical optimization that do uh, in practice actually uh, solve these problems uh, pretty efficiently, uh, just not in general. Uh, if, if you have a special case that uh, is easy to solve, it takes significantly less than exponential time. So to try and dumb that down real quick uh, before you hop in this fun. Um, so pretty much you're saying is um, it's not always a given that there is an exponential set of possible um, interpretations, but it's still very useful if you can have more than one because you're still introducing ambiguity. Uh, not quite. The exponential uh, size is the number of potential solutions you have to consider. So the, the, the logic here is basically you look at a transaction and it has a set of inputs and a set of outputs. And then you start looking at every subset of the inputs and every subset of the outputs. And you try and look for um, subsets that sum to the same thing. The assumption here is that uh, people are only mixing and sending back to themselves. So pay join completely breaks um, the assumptions underlying uh, uh, this like approach to, to kind of solving the transaction as it were. So there's an exponential number of combinations of inputs and outputs that you need to consider, or to be more precise, uh, the bell number. Um, and um, many of those are not going to sum to zero. Um, so that is computationally potentially difficult, but in practice, often it's not as difficult as it seems. And um, there's another downside, which is if one user is de-anonymized, like let's say you find out that a user in the coin join um, was responsible for a specific combination of inputs and outputs, then the difficulty of uh, de-anonymizing the rest of them using this technique also goes down exponentially. So it's not a very robust um, hardness assumption. Um, what is robust is if you have more than one solution, if there's multiple subsets that sum to zero, there isn't information in the transaction itself that tells you uh, um, which is the correct solution. And this is precisely the intuition behind the, the knapsack uh, paper. It's not just that they analyze the computational difficulty of analyzing what they call uh, subtransactions. It's also that they uh, propose a protocol where there's always going to be more than just one solution. Yeah. So, um, so pretty much like as, as long as you're introducing some ambiguity or you take the number of interpretations above one, um, you're still proportionately improving it to, to some degree. 
Yes. Yeah. And uh, that improvement is very robust. Uh, it's not an exponential number of interpretations. And I mean, you don't even need that because there's only, you know, a set number of inputs and outputs. So there couldn't be a, a number of participants exponential in the number of inputs and outputs. But um, yeah, it's it's a much stronger guarantee than okay, and, uh, just the computational difficulty. Yeah. And uh, it's fine. You, you've been trying to get a word in for a second. Yeah, can I be just uh, be the uh, devil's advocate for a second? So my general feeling that the whole community is really underestimate, overestimating the complexity of dynamizing um, coin joins. And uh, all what Yuval was saying is true on paper, like um, knapsack mixing and all these papers have exponential complexity in dynamizing coin uh, um, UTXOs, but it doesn't does not take into considerations like, for example, wallet fingerprints. So, um, being the devil's advocate, I think in practice, um, privacy guarantees of coin joins is way less than what uh, many people think. Um, yeah, that that's what I wanted to add. That's a very important point because all of these analyses kind of focus on one transaction in isolation and really in the anonymizing adversary has a lot more context to work with. Mm -hmm. And rec recently we just got a message uh, that there will be some paper coming out from UCL, if I'm not mistaken, hopefully soonish, and they will analyze uh, Wasabi coin joins and try to assess uh, quantitatively the privacy guarantees. So it would be super fun to read it. I'm really looking forward to it. And hopefully also the listeners will have a look at that paper. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a very important aspect of these types of, you know, protocols and software. And I mean, that's fundamentally at the core of Zerolink, I think, is trying to recognize all these different um, abstraction layers of where metadata can be acquired and, and trying to actually solve that holistically. Because, you know, if you miss one layer, um, that can start eroding the privacy. Yeah, privacy is so subtle that fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I mean, um, you guys maybe want to kind of wade into a bit of the uh, the open aspect of like what actual um, transaction structures um, you guys are considering or weighing the the trade offs of that this enables. Yes, one. I I, I just want to make one thing clear is that it's. Uh, it's not that we are still debating the transaction structure, it's that we aren't even debating it because we had a deal that uh, this, if, if we don't approach this conversation in a very, very structured way, then, then we just, it's gonna be just a mess. So we, we actually had a deal with each other that let's not talk about the transaction structure at all all uh, let's just make sure that we are going to be able we are going to be able to create any kind of transaction structure that we want and that's what we were working on so far so the transaction structure conversation in this show will be like everyone is has will have their own uh, own ideas and own opinions and they might be sometimes like a, like a miss yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of, this is kind of, I think, the the awesome part of this uh, framework is how generalizable it is. Um, so like, I, I fully expect to see years down the line entire different coordinators for different types of constructs. But I guess, uh, na name out of a hat, uh, Istvan, what, what's your thinking on this aspect of things? More, more diversity, more coordinators, the better. So, yeah. <laughs> But I, I mean, mean, in terms of like transaction um, structures or different types of coin joins that you could do with this, like what's your thinking on, you know, what would be a, a useful change to make there? So let, let me start then. I, okay. I tell you what my thinking here and then as always, nothing much will tell me why I'm wrong. So, <laughs> so my, my thinking is that we should create equal 
outputs and have equal inputs and then enable people to send in coin joints and they will be mixing on the equal inputs and also like uh, the wallet should look like have some some uniform distribution how your coins will be in your wallet and and there should be randomity but but your wallet should try to ensure that that you have x large coins uh and and some smaller coins so so that's what i would prefer to have and and when people are sending money in the coin joins itself then we would have the the privacy guarantees even on previous coin joins either on either on previous coin joins or on the inputs itself that happens to be the same uh, same amounts than what the user would say. So you'd be able to tell that who is sending, you would be able to tell who sent, the, you would be able to tell that where you're sending, but you don't that from where. So that I think that that could work uh, what are your thinking, guys? Honestly, I'm not really into this kind of research, but my high-level understanding is our desire with respect to the transaction structure is that the more use cases we can allow within this mixing functionality, the better. So currently, mixing is just mix to self. And if we can allow also mix to other, the better, because then people could use this mixing functionality inside the wallet not just for mixing for themselves, but also for potentially for payments. And I think in general, that's one of the downside of privacy technologies that they are like standalone technologies and, and you cannot use it for multiple purposes. And I think uh, the high level motivation for Wabi Sabi is to make it as general and, and as flexible as possible, because then um, hopefully more people could use it for many purposes yeah to mention really quickly uh in a recent episode of block digest i quoted someone from the zcash community who was trying to measure the different um types of transactions like shielded or unshielded that were happening on the network and um someone commented in that thread saying like you know i would love to be able to use zcash but it doesn't it doesn't seem like there's anywhere to accept it um, like even the foundation for Zcash wasn't accepting it. So uh, that's that's going to be a major problem or issue that needs to be solved going forward is there needs to be actual places where people can use it. Otherwise, the assumption is that people are just using it to move it around for themselves for no actual, uh, you know, economic uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that to like... I absolutely love the idea of payments inside the coin join. I just think that brings up an interesting, um, you know, issue in terms of subsets in the, the universal anonymity set of a protocol, because when you start getting into payments, well, like that payment amount is going to be a fingerprint. So, you know, what ways are there for, say, merchants or people receiving payments to aggregate multiple payments through this um, in a single round to obscure that? Or, you know, potentially the need to fragment um, a payment if you only have a single incoming payment. And just a way to, like, there needs to be some consideration and mechanism for obscuring the output amount in that transaction or the the sender can just find that that way so there's i guess several layers to this um the first thing you can consider is something like uh, join market has which is the um, sending of arbitrary amounts in order to to make a payment uh, and the sweeping of arbitrary inputs in order to consolidate them as part of the coin join um, the former is kind of possible in principle in Wasabi um, in the sense that you can bring in arbitrary amounts, but then you have to go to those uh, preset denominations 
And eventually you end up with uh, inputs of the denomination size that you then uh, can use to make a payment and you end up with a change. So there's uh, one like significant potential improvement is kind of uh, cutting through that and just being able to make a payment from a coin join directly. Uh, something that is distinctly better than that, though, because um, there's there's issues with this approach, which is um, you need to use the same amount and the same address if you're sending to a recipient that doesn't even know that you're trying to coin join. And if the coin join round fails, then people can maybe see that you're trying to make a payment. And if they target you, uh, they can do a denial of service attack on the round and in this way um, do um, use what's called an intersection attack to figure out um, which input is yours as well and kind of de-anonymize your backwards history so that there's uh, concerns there. Um, so uh, uh, an even better approach is if both the sender and the recipient are, are using uh, the Wabi Sabi scheme uh, because then um, so user A registers an arbitrary combination of inputs and creates a credential um, for the payment amount and then just hands over that credential to the recipient. The recipient can bring in additional inputs uh, in order to merge the amount or split it any which way that they want. Um, and this is very similar to pay join in the sense that the actual payment amount is uh, obscured. It doesn't appear on the blockchain, but it's also better um, uh, in in terms of uh, privacy between the sender and the recipient because neither of them learns uh, of each other's uh, inputs and outputs to the transaction. Um, so that, that would be possible as well. Um, so the, many new use cases like this are, are kind of made possible by, by having those arbitrary amounts. Yeah, and it, <clears throat> but it also kind of... Um you know, necessitates either uh, a varying amount of liquidity available to kind of pay join with yourself in the, the single coin join round or to, to keep, you know, um, standard um, denominated amounts or it requires a transaction structure um, more towards the, the knapsack end. Um, where you are just constructing that impossible to brute force to a single possible interpretation jumble combination. So I guess it's my turn to kind of speak about the the transaction structure that I have in mind. And uh, this is an idea that uh, for me goes back like a really long way. Um, I've been trying to convince people that it's worthwhile, um, I guess for like two years now. Um, and before that, I was assuming blind signatures and there were actually like really um, some uh, uh, major efficiency challenges. The The way that I, I'm i kind of imagining Wabi Sabi will be used is, uh, so why does an equal amount coin join work? Um, the, the reason for that is because the amounts are identical. There is no additional information um, that lets you distinguish between them. Um, and and that intuition is um, like also extends to whole transaction graphs. So uh, if you go back to Greg Maxwell's uh, post on coin joins, um, he talks about the transaction size limit and how uh, that's not really an issue. You can still have coin joins of an arbitrary size if you just split the um, like the the hypothetical coin join transaction that you want to make into a structure. Uh, his example was a class network, but um, you can you can have uh, any sort of switching network topology where so long as every final output in like a graph of transactions uh, is potentially linked to it, all of the prior inputs to this. Uh, something that's like an equal amount but just um as an anonymity set of like potentially thousands of users and though can't really uh, have a, a transaction like that um so that is a very powerful concept for um gaining anonymity set sizes but it's also inherently limiting because of that standard denomination um but you can like with cash we kind of get around that 
uh, right? We we only like in most countries except America, which is you know a little bit backwards. Uh, you have um, uh, what's called a one two five series, where there's only a small number of actual values, and every uh, bill or coin has one of those values, either a one, a two, or a five. Uh, multiplied by a magnitude. And by splitting up values in this way, you can kind of get a um, uh, a very efficient uh, way of representing any arbitrary number, right? You, like you, you pay for an amount, everybody knows how to make change. Uh, and it also works very similarly in uh, binary where like with a small number of bits, you can represent uh, arbitrary amount as a sum of powers of two. Um, the advantage to that is that uh, there's only a very small number of possible bits to use in any amount. And there's only a, a very small number of like decimal uh, values if you uh, go with with uh, the decimal approach. Um, and that allows people to kind of, um, like if they agree on those um, uh, common denominations, then they can... That they can gain anonymity through that uh, equal amount coin join uh, approach. The question is, how do you uh, compose these two things? How do you make it possible to pay uh, arbitrary amounts or to uh, uh, sweep arbitrary amounts uh, while still having the privacy benefit of um, uh, equal amount coin joins, uh, which require these uh, standard denominations? And so the the way I'm kind of uh, envisioning it, it works out is uh, if we only assume a binary for simplicity, uh, imagine every amount that goes into a coin join and every amount that leaves into a coin join is only allowed in this like uh, uh, arbitrary variable amount coin join as long as there are uh, at least k uh inputs and at least k outputs that are equal amounts for every one of the bits that is set in that uh, arbitrary amount. So for example, let's say I want to uh, spend uh, seven Satoshi. So seven Satoshi is like zero, one, one, one in binary. So I would only be allowed, and we're ignoring like minor fees for this example. So uh, I would only be allowed to register that amount as an input or an output if there is already um, uh, k inputs of one Satoshi, k inputs of two Satoshis, and k inputs of four Satoshis. And in this regard, uh, sorry, in, in this way, you, you kind of, um, like the knapsack uh, approach, you ensure that there is at least uh, a, a possible interpretation uh, for, for any one of these. So uh, because you can, you can take one of every inputs of each of those sets of equal amount coin joins that have only a single bit set, and you could say, well, those are plausibly linked to this uh, output amount that's just an arbitrary combination of bits. And if it, it works both ways, then like both ways in the sense that uh, it, it's true for both inputs and for outputs, every transaction uh, has um, a set of arbitrary inputs and a set of arbitrary outputs and kind of like a core of equal amount coin joins that confer plausible deniability to all of the values in that transaction. And this is possible to negotiate with like Wabi Sabi credentials. Um, and I think is kind of like a, uh, a more um, uh, pessimistic version of, of knapsack mixing uh, that uh, is also slightly easier to coordinate because you don't need to know the order in which uh, inputs are registered. Okay. Let me, let me try and, sum this up with an analogy and you can nitpick where the analogy breaks it. So you break everything down in terms of inputs and outputs into standard denomination bills like pennies, dimes, quarters, singles, fives, tens, twenties, fifties, and then hundreds. And then you have a magic box where everybody can toss money in there um and then gets a ticket for an amount or tickets for different denominations of those that total amount and the box is not opened until there are a certain number of hundreds a certain number of 50s 20s etc etc um as a required core 
so that when everybody just has the the money fall through the bottom of the box after it's opened and magically distribute to everybody, you have that framework of, well, this could be going to Bob or Alice or Charlie, um, and we're not sure because there's the right jumble of different denominations. Yeah, that's a that's a good way of putting it. And the reason this idea was not really practical before was if you only use the blind signature approach, then the coordinator knows exactly which coins you have and which coins you don't. Uh, and, and every coin denomination is kind of uh, its own uh, smaller anonymity pool, which means that to, to actually have privacy, what you need to do is literally take your input, split it up into like n uh, outputs, each of which is one of those standard denominations, mix those denominations separately in coin joins, and then recombine. But because uh, Wabi Sabi credentials kind of have a single uh, anonymity pool for all of the credentials instead of one per denomination with the blind signatures, you can actually do this directly uh, in a single coin join transaction. And you don't pay that additional cost of like creating up to a logarithmic number of intermediate outputs just to gain privacy. Yeah. So you're kind of um, making much more efficient um, in terms of block space use, um, the trade-off between trying to have perfect global um, plausible deniability for much more dynamic, enough plausible deniability um, to be effective. Yeah. And the w one thing that is really important to me is to have those like perfect low hamming weight amounts, like literally just a power of two of Satoshi or literally just a, a, a single decimal digits, like a thousand Satoshis or uh, 50,000 Satoshis or something. Um, both on the input side and on the output side, because then the anonymity set size for those uh, mixes becomes the entire graph. It's not just the single transaction. So you, realistically, you only need a handful of like inputs of every size uh, and a handful of inputs of uh, every, like, sorry, a handful of inputs and a handful of outputs of every size in order to um, confer plausible deniability to a uh, potentially very large set of uh, input and output amounts of uh, arbitrary value. Yeah. And so, you know, re realistically speaking, I mean, this is kind of just a new um, analytical way to look at the the anonymity derived from these protocols um, versus like what's conventionally done now, right? I'm not sure exactly what you mean there. Well, I mean, in terms of strategy, um, like most of these protocols at this point are shooting for an asymptomatic approach um, to that perfect anonymity set. Whereas this kind of strategy is just shooting for there is a degree that is good enough and you can gain a lot more efficiency by just hitting good enough and not continuing to try to asymptotically approach the perfect um, global set. Yeah, I think that's a, a so what I'm primarily concerned with is uh, like having, like how do you guarantee a lower bound? How do you guarantee that in this transaction, which let's say has N participants, uh, how do I ensure that there's at least N interpretations? Because um, anything kind of more than that is not really contributing anything in the scope of that transaction. Um, on the other hand, like when you consider the whole graph, um, right, like all the possible mixes, uh, so, for example, in, in Wasabi's case, because the denominations are um, uh, variable and they reduce over time in order to allow people to remix, there's a built-in incentive to um, like remix uh, quickly because you save in fees. And because you stay less time inside of like this graph of mixes, uh, there's a, a lower overall liquidity, a lower overall uh, number of participants for any time interval, uh, which is um, a smaller anonymity set uh, overall. So this is kind of trying to address um, 
like it, it's it's very hard to make strong guarantees about that kind of uh, thing. But you, you it it does gain you a lot of uh, benefits if if you take care of that. Uh, but what's important is to ensure that the like the minimum uh, amount is required, and that minimum can be a, a very conservative number. I think actually uh, I would like to ask uh, Ishtvan to comment about his recent research on tornado cash and um, that uh, like temporal aspect and the the overall size of the mixing pool because I think it's relevant. Yeah, uh, dump it on us. Um, I mean it's quite different structure than what's a Bitcoin joins. But um, so what what exactly are you interested in uh, with regards to Tornado Cash? So uh, the problem I was highlighting in in Wasabi's current mixing is that uh, remixing kind of incentivizes you to enter a mix, remix several times, and then eventually leave and do that uh, rather quickly. Uh, because otherwise you end up paying more in fees and uh, you end up creating more change outputs. Uh, and I I, uh, I mean, you used a, a, a similar sort of uh, analysis of people entering the mix. I mean, Tornado Cash's uh, intrinsic privacy is much stronger because it uses uh, zero knowledge proofs, if I'm not mistaken. But you used uh, these uh, temporal patterns and amounts in order to uh, de-anonymize users, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are absolutely right in that. But um, so in that case, but so this temporality is kind of um, similar, exactly the same for every kind of mixer technology, because uh, whenever you put your money into a mixing scheme, you don't want to leave your money in that magical box, as Shinobi said, for really long time because you lose your liquidity you want to use that money and um so this incentive is also really prelevant in tornado cash like a lot of people um use tornado cash in a way that they deposited i don't know at midnight and then five minutes later they withdraw so it's like pretty easy to to link those deposits and withdraws so yeah i think this kind of inherent to any kind of mixing technology yeah, and so um, you know, no part like uh, you know, like you said when we we started this, like everybody's kind of of their own mind as far as the actual transaction structure. You know, like what what are your thoughts on like nothing much uh, in his kind of scheme? You know, I'm 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 just listening and learning a lot. That's that's the truth here. It's a, we, we really had a zero discussion on this policy in order not to not to in order to be able to concentrate on the the current part of the research. But uh, so 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 this was my first time of hearing this idea in full from him and uh, and it's interesting. Um, I I might have one way to break it, but that's that's kind of a discussion for a later part. Or you know what I'm 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 just asking that uh, because in in your scheme uh, things are reliant on other people's input that how how you are organizing the output amounts are reliant on the other people's input and you know the denial of service protection of uh, of 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 the scheme of Wabi Sabi and like like every every this kind of coin join scheme relies on failures a lot of failures and if the first and and our thinking was at least right now we are creating the protocol right and our thinking is that if in the blame round everyone submits the exact same thing everyone is going with the exact same thing uh, then then there is no privacy leak but now you are saying that if the input set changes then then we have to change the output set too, and I think that could be a problem here. So there's uh, kind of two ways to um, restrict that. One is to only restrict the input side or only restrict the output side, and the second is to restrict both. Um, I, I think it's kind of conceptually easier if we only think about the output side. Um, so imagine that you want to make a payment of like a weird number of satoshis um to a preset address 
um, the coordinator would only let you register such an amount if there is an, a sufficient number of inputs and outputs um, that kind of provide that masking factor. Those could be your outputs. So for example, let's say you want to register an amount seven and nobody's registered uh, uh, four yet. And uh, four is two to the power two, and bit two is set in the amount seven. And so, like, if the anonymity set size for that bit is not big enough, uh, then you could just register an output of that size as changed before. Um, and I, I think the, the general intuition is very much like you described earlier. You want to have your UTXO set. Uh, generally be like large uh, and small inputs of like the the entire range of uh, uh, usable values. And it makes sense to, for privacy reasons, to keep those as uh, like low Hamming weight amounts, as round amounts. Um, what you, like the, the, the denial of service case here is, okay, well, maybe you're not allowed to make that payment and maybe you don't have enough uh, uh, amounts uh like because you so you can't register a change amount or you can't register an additional input to, to create uh another output that would mask your uh intended output uh in that case you would need to uh create those intermediate outputs you need to break up your intended amount into uh, self spans to those like low hamming weight uh, amounts and eventually, uh, in a later round, actually be able to make that payment, but you would be uh, making it by spending these uh, like uh, higher uh, anonymity set size inputs. Uh, that, that's kind of the way that I see it. Um, the coordinator might be completely lax. Like maybe the coordinator just says like, hey, this is a free for all, like cash fusion. Uh, and you could enforce this sort of privacy policy on the client side. Uh, you could say, uh, I will only register arbitrary amounts if I observe that other users have registered uh, um, those like low hanging weight amounts. Uh, I think a, a more, um, uh, like a better approach for fungibility or for uh, developing the privacy of the ecosystem is to still have the coordinator uh, enforce a minimum limit. Uh, and it, it can be pretty low. Um, so for example, you could say maybe the, the minimum anonymity set size for every bit is just two. Um, but that's still enough to give you plausible deniability for uh, every single bit. And if you have the transaction graph uh, that kind of inherits those. So like you have a network of mixed outputs of uh, every denomination, um, then every input into the transaction uh, inherits a fairly large anonymity set size. A two is actually not really good enough for um, um, the, the reason that like if you have a very large number of arbitrary amounts and you only have two of every bit, um, then uh, you can still make certain inferences um, about the the remaining amounts. Like you still need a uh, like a minimum sized core of uh, uh, anonymity set size for every denomination, um, and it's actually a tiny bit better because like you could say, well, if I have you know two inputs of size two and one output of size four, those are potentially linked. Uh, so it doesn't strictly need to be bitwise. Um, and you can keep like uh, making that estimate more and more generous, but it's still um, an upper bound on the lower bound of what your anonymity set size in that specific transaction is. So re regarding the, the payments in coin joins, uh, I think there is something important that that we are we are somewhat missing here. That it's very nice that we can do payments in coin joins, uh, but uh, but. I think it's okay if someone does not gain any privacy with payments in coin joins. So I think it's okay to only guarantee privacy probabilistically there because uh, where you should get the privacy is actually that you are mixing a couple of times, uh, that you are sending in mixed UTXOs into the coin joins in the first place. So in case the coin join doesn't give you any privacy for your payment, then then you still have it. That that's 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 kind of the only way that you could actually ensure like some very strong privacy guarantees, and 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 this kind of brings me back that 
I think the free for all approach, like the coordinator does not try to police uh, what what amounts you 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 register. It's just the the clients are trying to 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 have some some consensus but but the coordinator doesn't restrict anything that's i think that's that's we should do but we'll, we'll see we'll we'll go through this this conversation in a in a structured way and hopefully we will find an optimal solution for that this kind of goes back to the idea of having multiple coordinators and you know you could say, like, let's let it solve this problem for itself, maybe. Um, my personal uh, uh, feeling about this is that uh, you're right about it not being critical, because if it's opportunistic, then you can still gain something, but it's not strictly worse than had you made the payment uh, naively to begin with. Uh, and the more users that you have still participating with arbitrary amounts, the more your chances of still gaining privacy in this way are. Um, I still think it's uh, beneficial for a coordinator to still enforce uh, some minimal amount of mixing inside of every such coin draw transaction because it has um, uh, a, a benefit for the ecosystem overall. It's not just a benefit for privacy, it's a benefit for fungibility when you do that. Um, cause you, you make it more possible for those, uh, like privacy nihilist users to participate in a way that benefits the privacy of users who are concerned and who are careful about, um, always like mixing, uh, and never making payments, uh, without a sufficient anonymity set size. My concern is I don't think you can enforce that because, because, you, I don't think you can enforce that without losing privacy because how does the blaming uh, work? It's like you have a coin join, someone doesn't sign, and then you will have a coin join with the exact same inputs except the person who does not sign. And then you go down and down if, if, if there are more and more people who don't, don't sign. And, you know, you... If you don't accept the exact same operations that they did in the very first coin join, then I think there are some serious privacy leaks there. So on the input side, you're right. There's nothing really that you can do. Um, but the input side is uh, already predetermined amounts, and it's uh, just a monotonically shrinking set. Um, you go to smaller and smaller subsets. On the output side, you can enforce that and basically uh, force the whole round to fail uh, in the degenerate case, or users can say, well, instead of, um, I mean, I say users, but really it's just the, the, the software. Uh, like instead of making this arbitrary payment in this amount, that amount is, uh, sorry, in this round, that amount is maybe no longer legal because uh, other outputs have dropped out. Um, then you could always still make those like mix like uh, amounts, right? So you could uh, bring in a, uh, like going back to that example, let's say you have seven Satoshi and you want to pay five Satoshi and take two as change, but nobody registered uh, a sufficient number of uh, inputs to kind of mask that amount, then maybe for this round, you need to output a two, a four, and a one uh, and only recombine them in, in the next coin join in order to actually successfully make that payment. Uh, I, I don't think that's a privacy leak because uh, you're going from... Um, uh, high entropy amounts, amounts with a lot of information in them, uh, to lower uh, entropy amounts that have a, a, a lower Hamming weight uh, and therefore reveal uh, less information and have a higher likelihood of being uh, um, uh, to co of coinciding with uh, similar amounts in the 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 mix component of these coin joins. Um, it, it's not mandatory. I mean, like you, you can say the policy is uh, to not restrict that and uh, um, uh, still, I think, have many benefits. Uh, the question is, you know, what is a uh, how do you do the mechanism design? How do you align everybody's incentives so that you, on average, 
uh, gain the most privacy, uh, the highest anonymity set sizes, uh, the most liquidity requirements, uh, and the lowest cost uh, for all users in order to maximize adoption for this stuff. Um, and I, I don't know a simple answer to that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, big things don't get fully flushed out and solved overnight. But I mean, I personally think this is a very important direction to go into and flesh out just because, you know, the the clock is kind of ticking and the elephants in the room um, as far as how high the demand for block space is going to get. And so I think that these types of protocol designs for this type of stuff that try to maintain the original purpose but also do so efficiently in terms of block space like that's an absolutely critical thing long term or these types of protocols just break um effectively uh through economic pressures when we get into those environments yeah, thank you that you mentioned because most of the discussion before between no par and nothing much completely missed like the third dimension of this problem, namely block space. So like, okay, we really need to max out uh, financial privacy, that's for sure. Second, uh, transaction fees for users, we want to minimize it. But the third angle of this uh, optimization problem is uh, we also don't want to... We also would like ideally to minimize uh, the block space and yeah, it's just a huge trade off space. And I think uh, between these three, you should just, you can only choose two um, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, it's really an important thing to consider because ultimately um, fees go up. Um, two things happen to the kind of like naive implementations that exist right now, which all mostly count on repetitive remixing. Um, the price for it goes way up. And we've seen historically during the 2017 fee market that join market pretty much just ground to a halt um, during that period. And then also the practical cost in terms of UTXOs um, that you can create go up. So you effectively have pretty much the, the these types of privacy tools in that environment um, price out anybody who is not above this rising threshold of wealth. And like it's, it, it's, it doesn't remain economically viable for lower amounts. That, that's, uh, I think, a very important observation. Uh, and one thing I'm somewhat optimistic about, although this is a, a huge um, challenge of uh, integration, is that um, when you do, um, when you have a protocol like this and you do uh, coin joins, um, there's a, a, an opportunity for uh, batched payments and opportunistic consolidation that actually actually uh, helps you um, uh, with uh, increasing your UTXO set efficiency uh, and reducing your fees as long as your wallet is large enough. Um, so uh, there's a, um, a, a Merch, I forget his last name, I'm sorry, uh, but his uh, thesis and uh, there, there's a, a talk, uh, I think, for the in the San Francisco uh, Bitcoin developers meetup uh, where like he describes, uh, he the, the work that he's selection research, right? Yes. Uh, and he describes how he applied this research, uh, at BitGo, uh, to manage, uh, wallets of like, uh, fairly large, uh, institutional users, um, with like two main use cases in mind. Uh, I think one is, uh, a, a user that mainly uh, receives arbitrary amounts and the other is a user that both receives and sends, if I remember correctly. Um, and I think that the techniques he was using there are, uh, uh there is a strong incentive to kind of apply them in the context of, a of these coin joins. And, and, uh, another really interesting thing that's, uh, been happening is, uh, bull Bitcoin uses Wasabi. Uh, to process, uh, I think, uh, definitely withdrawals, but I think also deposits. 
Um, and the, the rationale that they give for this is that um, uh, they're obligated, I think, under Canadian law to uh, uh, provide better assurances for user privacy, which I think is, you know, the, the right direction for exchanges to go in. So a use case that I'm kind of um, interested in, in, in and have been thinking a lot about is um, could you have a scenario where um, like, uh, large users like exchanges uh, actually end up uh, saving money uh, and in increasing their efficiency uh, by batching and by opportunistically consolidating in a way that um, uh, ends up uh, helping these mixes. Um, uh, so like everybody kind of participates in the same uh, privacy pool uh, and some users do it for uh, individual privacy uh, but then they, they benefit from other users um, maybe doing it for just completely self-interested reasons like uh, saving on fees. Yeah, by the way, one, one interesting thing uh, that we are playing with the idea that we don't take, we don't enforce any fee. Like, you know, currently Wasabi Coin joins are enforcing, uh, are taking fees, coordinator fees, like like that's, that's how we can like make this research even possible. But uh, we are playing with the idea if we wouldn't do that, we wouldn't take fees from the coin joins, but rather it would be a somewhat voluntary uh, payment on the client side from changes those cannot be really used for anything useful. Uh, that's 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 interesting because in in that way uh if you change the code then you would never pay fees uh but on the other hand if you change the code you would never pay fees so i still have a have some work to do on convincing the others but uh i think that's that's possible and and this could this could result in interesting things uh like like if uh, if um, bull Bitcoin would 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 say that well it's 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 awesome but it's just way too expensive then then they could they could change the code and 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 even if they don't pay coordinator fees at least they would uh, provide liquidity to coin joins uh, so so that I think that's that's really interesting. Okay, so kind of trading off some of your income to incentivize um, larger liquidity pools entering. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's it's not just that, but uh, if we are, if you make a transaction and it would create some some change, that change could could actually be the payment there, and and that would would actually improve your privacy a lot because that would make make it uh if if they cannot recognize that that change is actually a payment then 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 they cannot even tell anything about the transaction correctly or or any other transaction okay nothing much is there a reason you posted the uh, laugher curve in the chat <laughs> I just think it's a similar. I mean, as far as I know, it's kind of uh, uh, like economic pseudoscience, or um, I, I've, I've not studied it closely, but I, I think it's been like contested or even debunked. Uh, but it's kind of a similar kind of question. Like uh, in uh, different countries, you have different tax rates, and uh, the proportion of tax revenue, um, sorry, the the amount, the absolute amount of tax revenue. Uh, that a country uh, derives is not linearly linked to uh, the tax rate. Uh, rather, you see the sort of uh, uh, bell curve type shape where uh, if you try to tax too uh, heavily, then uh, people start you know, uh, avoiding taxes or just the economy becomes uh, stifled. And I think it's, it's a similar sort of uh, thing here um, where ideally there would be uh, enough fees that um, both mining fees and coordinator fees, and there's a, a strong like uh, asterisk here where um, the 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 reason the coordinator fees are potentially not as strong a disincentive to 
do a civil attack is that the coordinator itself is gaining money by doing that and can attack the rounds itself. So like if the coordinator is gaining money, uh, it, it can costlessly civil attack its own mixes and it gains liquidity, which is the other difficult problem. Um, so, uh, wait, 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 wait. I, I mean, the network fees has to be paid like, uh, 99 times, uh, for CBLing one person, you know, so it's, it's not really costless there. Yeah. I, I, I meant only with respect to the coordinator fees. Uh, but I mean, if the coordinator is uh, gaining um, money from other coin join rounds and it's increasing its net worth over time, uh, it, it gets easier and easier for the coordinator to do a Sybil attack. But uh, yes, that, 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 that's a very good point that it's not entirely costless. Uh, the, the mining fees never go away. I, I mean, except maybe if you have, uh, uh, like maybe Jihan runs his own uh, Wasabi coordinator. <laughs> I mean, that's a cost for them, too, because it's like they are not taking the fees from other people, right? Yeah, that's true. There's an opportunity cost. Um, but the, the point is, like, um, the, the reason I, I kind of brought it up uh, jokingly, I, I didn't actually want to discuss it, is just that the there's a, probably a sweet spot uh, somewhere along the curve of, like, uh, what is a fee rate that actually... Uh, gives reasonable users uh, reasonable assurances about civil protection and gives a good cost for privacy. Um, but there's no one size fits all. Uh, and it's a like a nonlinear optimization problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's an interesting, uh, you know, trade off to consider there. But um, I think I think I'm gonna come out of left field. And uh, I told you guys I was gonna do this. But uh, you know, to some degree, um, a lot of the zero link framework is just a general coordination mechanism to construct a, a Bitcoin transaction. So what are your guys' thoughts with ZMN SCP um, XJ and his uh, proposal to take a zero link coordinator and apply Wabi Sabi to coin swaps? So I just want to say that uh, we asked him in person and he said, uh, just call him Z-Man. So, so yeah, that, that might be easier to talk about. Anyway, uh, nothing much was the one who actually looked into that. So, so I think he's going to reply there. I think it's a really cool proposal. Uh, and uh, I was kind of like caught by surprise because uh, we had asked him uh, to review uh, the the Wabi Sabi paper since he's uh, like an expert on uh, uh, various uh, Bitcoin techniques, and um, and then I posted like just the, our first draft on the mailing list, and like I think within an hour he had this like entire post lined up uh, where he described something uh, which uh, I didn't anticipate at all, and is is really cool. Um, my kind of mental model for it is so um, a coin swap transaction. Um, or sorry, a coin swap uh, exchange is kind of a disjoint on the transaction graph, but still has the um, the kind of theft uh, resistance guarantees that um, coin joins do. Uh, instead of everybody bringing in their inputs and then everybody needing to provide an output, and only when everybody has signed is the transaction valid. Uh, you have um, back out transactions and, and it's like a multi-stage thing. But the, the key advantage there is that you don't make it obvious on the blockchain uh, that you're participating um, in that specific privacy transaction. So his proposal is, uh, well, why don't you have uh, a single maker that's kind of like the coordinator be the counterparty to multiple coin swap participants. So different coin swap participants uh, all do their setup transactions, and then they negotiate uh, Wabi Sabi credentials with that maker in order to request specific output amounts. Um, and then um, and this is a little bit similar to Chris Belcher's proposal in terms of um, like splitting the amounts to prevent amount correlation. So um, but the, the key difference there is that there would be one maker that provides all of the liquidity 
and creates uh, like a batch transaction for the second phase of the, the coin swap. So um, uh, basically, you can get somebody else to make a batch payment on your behalf, uh, which may be a soft spend. Um, and the advantage that Wabi Sabi uh, provides uh, for uh, this kind of hypothetical protocol is that the maker no longer knows which out is to which uh, party. Uh, there's a, a difficulty there, which is uh, it's much harder in this setting to know what amounts the other users are requesting and uh, whether or not the other users even exist. Um, so uh, there, there's many like, um, and, and of course, coin swaps are uh, more complicated because it's a multi-stage protocol. And so the, the implementation side of this, I think, is uh, a little bit fraught with peril. Uh, but I think the idea is um, really cool. And um, I was uh, uh, really like, um, it felt really nice to see somebody uh, so quickly, like taking our uh, initial idea and applying it to uh, something kind of radical. Uh, and then not only that, he, he did it again in the coin pool uh, thread uh, by suggesting uh, that, that it's useful for um, uh, that proposal. How would you apply Wabi Sabi to coin pool? So in coin pool, um, my mental model for coin pool is, is very similar to a coin join transaction, but instead of uh, an output for every user, what you have is a single output for everybody that's like, uh, a taproot uh, congestion controlled, uh, like uh, uh, may maybe it's like off CTV or maybe it's just a taproot uh, with pre-signed transactions for everybody. Um, uh, but the, the idea is like everybody shares a single output. So the final outcome of what is fundamentally still a coin join doesn't necessarily make it to the uh, chain at all because you can always collaboratively spend it and keep your kind of your mixed virtual UTXOs uh, off chain and destroy them off chain. Uh, but you still need a mechanism where the users uh, uh, agree on what the structure of that um, uh, multi-party output is, or like what the structure of the uh, pre-signed transactions uh, 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 spending those uh, outputs are. Uh, and it's a little bit uh, confusing because there's uh, like they discuss two variations, uh, one with just like a taproot and one with uh, um, something like uh, an accumulator construction or op CTV uh, in Jeremy Rubin's reply. So like, there's multiple ways of doing it, but like the, the intuition of um, multiple users sharing a single output. Um, uh, I, I think is still useful, and uh, those those users still need to find a way of privately uh, negotiating what they're going to agree about, and and that's uh, very similar to the the problem that uh, okay. any coin join protocol has to solve. Okay, so it would be using it to coordinate, um, like what um, the the root multi sig is committing to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's actually really interesting. I hadn't even considered that. Um, wow. Okay. So um, to, to kind of slide back to the, the coin swap um, proposal, though, one of the things that immediately popped into my mind when I saw that was a single coordinator um, potentially operating both coin joins and coin swaps and the potential for atomicity between the two things. So that that's another very interesting direction. Um, there is a slight difficulty with coin swaps, um, like in the original formulation, which is that both parties have to kind of uh, enter the uh, arrangement before the protocol can proceed. Because uh, both sides need to, to like put their money into the the multi sig and and have uh, their backout transaction, and in order for the other side to sign the backup tr backout transaction before you uh, actually send the money to the multi sig address, you need to know the transaction ID that you're going to withdraw, which is a little bit uh, tricky in the coin join setting. But uh, Ruben Thompson's uh, succinct atomic swaps um, are like a step. Uh, for improving that, and uh, Max uh, Hellbrand 
uh, recently uh, came up with an idea of how to um, combine coin swaps and uh, coin joins in this way by observing that with uh, Ruben's uh, uh, swap protocol, uh, only one side actually needs to uh, to to know the the transaction ID in this way for the backout transaction. Um, so I, I think there is a good potential there. I, I have a slightly different and simpler idea of, of how combination of coin joins and coin swaps could could be very good could work uh, because if if you think about it, uh, privacy projects, Bitcoin privacy projects are coming up, and 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 it's not that hard anymore to to gain privacy with Bitcoin. Even if you are an Edward Snowden, it, it, it just it, you can do that now. And now, what we we might want to target is is, is someone who 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 thinks who does not th think privacy as something crucial, but it's something that's nice to have. So, how we could do that is that we could have smaller coin joins but those are quick and seamless and maybe the user doesn't even know those are happening and on those smaller coin joins they are creating somewhat equalish outputs and if you coin swap on them because you are the Edward Snowden the Julian Assange of this world you are coin swapping on them then then you are coin swapping with other people who did coin joins so so it's like it's like chain analysis can can look into stuff and and he can think that oh this is a very small coin join and probably this is what happened but 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 still not 100% sure and that's what normal people that's what privacy normal people would get and what what the Edward Snowdens would get is that um, they coin swap on their coin join output and that you will never be able to figure out where that coin went from there. It's uh, I, I think that's that's how you could serve both the normal people and the 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 people who privacy is like very crucial to. So I, I, I think that that's 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 a more more obvious way of combining coin joins with coin swaps than 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 other schemes but but yeah um other ideas took us to space so so i i i'm excited about them too <laughs> yeah the, i mean what i was saying earlier uh is only if you really wanted to all happen like in the space of the same transaction uh i think the privacy benefits of just uh uh interleaving coin joins and coin swaps as a user um, are uh, readily available uh, even with no integration whatsoever. Uh, it's just that maybe you can gain a little bit of efficiency. Um, and that what the point that you made about um, like different users having different threat models um, is especially like th this is why I'm especially excited about all these covert techniques. So like uh, coin swaps and pay joins um, potentially improve privacy for uh, regular transactions as well. And um, it's, it's, it's a very positive sum type interaction where like the whole is much greater than the sum of its parts. Actually, I was very careful not to bring it up because I'm not quite sure that's, that's true because yeah, let's just, just think about the coin swaps uh, after coin join case that let's say only, let's say 1% uh, of the coin join outputs are coin swapped, then you know your your heuristic is if you 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 assume that there are no coin swaps happening, then your heuristic is ninety nine percent correct. So it's like it's like this this argument never made that much sense. That uh, well, yeah, if you do one coin, if, if there is a single coin swap on the whole blockchain then the whole blockchain is anonymous because we don't know which which coins did that coin swap you see it's it's just it's just 
these are caught heuristics for a reason. These are not caught conclusions, but heuristics. These are likely scenarios. And these heuristics don't go away just because there is a couple of coin swaps or pay joins. Uh, there must be a very substantial amount of coin swaps and pay joins to make those heuristics unreliable. Yeah, that's a fair criticism. Mm -hmm. what, what I have in mind, to be clear, is uh, Chris Belcher's proposal for coin swaps, which I think um, does do a far better job of uh, defeating these heuristics than uh, previous proposals. So, uh, Istvan, I know... Um... You know, when uh, I first said I was going to bring this up at some point, <clears throat> you said you hadn't really read too deeply into the coin swap proposal. But, you know, do, do you have any thoughts on potential composability between coin swap and coin join? Well, I, I mean, I'm really not the expert on the topic, so I, I leave I leave this to the guys. Um, yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Let's talk about Ethereum then. I, I, I'm <laughs> sure you are you are good in that. I was actually. I was... Sorry, go ahead, Jenny. Um, I mean, if it's not too unrelated, I'm curious how you came up with the name Wabi Sabi. Does anyone have an explanation? Was it, <laughs> was it Rafa? You know, we we were working on this protocol for for almost two months already, and and came up with five different names, uh, and. And maybe the best that we had is confidential coin join construction, uh, and and it just it just no name made sense. And and then okay, let's have a call, and 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 in one hour we decide that what's going to be the name of it because because we we have to call this thing something that we are working on, you know, and uh, and. And after one hour passed, we still don't have a name that everyone agrees on. And then someone, someone, someone just shouts in. Uh, I think Gergő, uh, the co one of the CEO of Wasabi, that uh, maybe let's call it Wabi Sabi. And and it's like everyone liked it. I I think it's a bit cheesy to call something so important. Uh, that's so similar to a name of a product but you know like at some point you had to say yes we we have to go with something and and other people seem to like it so so that's that's fine by me i think it has very beautiful symbolism because bitcoin privacy is kind of inherently flawed we didn't explain yet what wabi sabi means to the listeners maybe they don't know it explain not yourself. all of our listeners japanese i said explain yourselves gentlemen so it's like a japanese worldview like accepting um the world and its imperfections and finding beauty in this imperfection and yuval was um referring to this that like we we kind of acknowledge the imperfection of Bitcoin privacy, but still we we acknowledge it and we try to improve upon it. So I, I think it's, uh, and it also rhymes kind of to Wasabi. So like Gergő has immediately said this uh, as a proposal, I was like, fuck, we need to choose it. Like, uh, because all, all the rest of the names we were thinking about, it was like super technical names. I don't know, like confidential coin join, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's just too... I don't know, boring, like this Wabi Sabi has some appeal in it and, and uh, I, I just love it, honestly. Yeah, I don't think that's cheesy at all. Yeah, I, I really like the name. So I guess, you know, kind of let's just shift this into just like general like privacy in this space um, as far as the discussion. You know what I mean? I think we just went through a massive amount of, of different technical proposals. But, you know, there, there's still like the larger issues of getting that in people's hands, of motivating them to use these things. Because like Nopara said, you know, you can't just do a coin swap or two and that changes anything. Like it's, it's more like herd immunity. You know, like um, 
what do you guys think are like the the friction points and the the roadblocks there? For, from my perspective, I think uh, what is I I just don't like the belief that people tend to really simplify things like uh, uh, a lot of person in the community thinks uh, as technologies like coin joins is a black box and then if i use it then i will be safe and then i don't need to worry about anything anymore uh, from at least from a privacy perspective and i think this kind of simplification and this kind of mentality should be kind of killed uh, I, I just don't like this uh, and and i'm really looking forward to this upcoming work um, by researchers from ucl uh, like empirically measuring um What's the Bitcoin joint privacy guarantees? And I think more of this kind of work should be done in the eyes of the public. I'm pretty sure uh, some something similar was already conducted by chain analysis, but obviously they don't really publish uh, their results. But uh, my general thinking is that um, reality is is uh, is way worse than we we think. Um, and and we are just over over optimistic about privacy guarantees of coin joins. Um, maybe this is a dark thinking, but I, I mean it, it. In this field, it's better to be pessimistic than optimistic. So yeah, we should be prepared for the worst. Maybe in five years there will be another Edward Snowden coming out of chain analysis and then publish that they knew all the all the mappings between input and output UTXOs in all of us to be coin joins. Who will who knows? Uh, maybe this would this could happen. I don't know. I hope not. But yeah, generally speaking, I think we are really we we have a lot of uh, work to do, o o both on academic side and also on on the industry side. There's a I... NSA motto: the attack never gets uh, like the the attack only gets uh, worse; it never gets better, or something. Or it depends on your perspective. I think it applies doubly so to blockchains where the data never goes away in theory. Mm -hmm. I, but uh, I'm sorry, I was just going to ask uh, if Janine or uh, Chris have any thoughts on the, the matter. I just want to touch on that last point because I think it might be relevant to some of our listeners, whether they're technical or not. I think whenever you're using some of these really edgy technologies that are still under development, uh, you need to consider the psychological impact it's having on you as you're using it. If you're using any of these privacy preserving tools thinking that you're private and not thinking about the temporal nature of privacy then you're actually in a way revealing more about yourself than if you are in a pseudo public sphere like if you're on twitter and you don't have many followers and you say something and you kind of have a background understanding that this could come back to hurt you one day and then whenever you're using tor or wasabi or any of these you sort of go in with a false expectation of privacy and i think it's important that people understand that whilst privacy as a concept is spatially local it's not temporally local like you know the room is bigger than you think um i mean my perspective on it is similar to what jameson lott pointed out years ago in one of his posts um is that the biggest uh privacy hole in the space that affects the majority of people is the fact that they're giving their personal information to third parties. And um, as I'm going to point out in a newsletter that I'm about to launch, um, the they, they're also not aware of like um, how much KYC is actually being done. Like when people think of KYC and chain analysis, they're thinking they're thinking of just you know oh i'm providing my government issued identity document to them that's kyc but under the hood they're also doing tons of analysis on what kind of device you're using what kind of browser you're using what your ip address is and all of these like fingerprint identifiers um that they they don't necessarily say that they are using that as part of kyc but basically every like all the data that you're giving them could be used for that purpose and it's the same with chain analysis um they could say oh we're just doing we're just we're, we're just doing analysis of the blockchain but we know that's not true like a lot of these companies in some way or another are either helping other companies or they're doing it themselves to combine off-chain data with on-chain data and that's how they're able to identify people 
And it was really funny. There was a uh, debate between Alex Gladstein recently and Tom Robinson, the co-founder of Lyptic. And it was very interesting to watch him at, at, at f- through most of the debate. Um, Robinson was claiming that you know they don't do surveillance they do analysis like the the what their work doesn't involve de-anonymizing people and then at the same time he was asked like well how you know do you have any clients in the world that would be off limits to you and he point blank said that they have a moral obligation to not provide their tools uh to like authoritarian governments so he was basically admitting that that there is a connection between the software that they're building and the consequences in terms of enforcement and companies potentially closing people's accounts, locking them out of their funds. Like they're, he was trying to separate himself from those consequences, but then he also acknowledged this moral obligation when it came to authoritarian governments. But how does that obligation not exist for governments that are not quite dictatorships, but may be corrupt in many different ways yeah that's um you know a the the idea that they're not actively trying to de-anonymize people and gather information is a joke like one of the dirty little secrets of this space is shit tons of the electrum servers out there are run by those companies to get that off-chain metadata and more tightly correlate and de-anonymize things And that's why it's so important to cover every level of that stack that can leak that metadata because, yeah, they're not just looking at the blockchain. Like, that's a lie. There was... Like, uh, there was something a bit disingenuous about what, like, even if you take at face value, what he claimed, and I think that claim seems to stand up, is that they sell unique identifiers. So something like uh, UUID or like user 12345 was the example given in the, uh, in the, where um, uh, uh, they sell that information as a unique identifier to um, uh, exchanges and then exchanges go and they correlate or anybody with uh, KYC requirements goes and correlates the uh, transaction data um, uh, that's been clustered in this way with uh, personally identifying details. Um, but this r- reminds me of uh, like um, an important paper um, the by uh, Sweeney and Samarati, uh, the one that introduced the concept of K-anonymity, where they showed uh, very clearly that in the United States uh, census data, which was considered uh, to be uh, fairly like privacy preserving just because it, it didn't have uh, names and addresses or something like that, uh, they uh, correlated the uh, census data with the voter registration, which had a different set of uh, what they called uh, quasi identifiers. I don't know if that term was introduced in that paper, but basically they managed to, given just the uh, uh, gender, the zip code and the birth date, uh, they managed to uh, fully de-anonymize like 80% of the U.S. population, or it may, may even have been more. Um, and the reason I find his claim kind of disingenuous is that it kind of, I mean, this paper is from 1998. It's a very well-established fact in the, like, the privacy research field um, that uh, quasi-identifiers, uh, when combined in this way, are identifiers. Uh, and uh, this is de-anonymization. Uh, there's also another very important paper by uh, Vitaly Shmatikov and Arvind Naranian which uh, took the uh, Netflix recommendation graph. They had a competition to like do better uh, predictions of uh, recommendations, if I remember correctly. And they, quote, de-anonymized the data. And uh, uh, the researchers showed that just based on the ratings uh, and uh, correlating to uh, publicly available IMDb data, they were able to basically de-anonymize all Netflix users uh, and their preferences. Um, so th- it's for somebody who's in the business of um, dealing with uh, uh, privacy-sensitive information and, and identifying users, claiming that they don't de-anonymize users is a thing. I, I think it's a, it's a very um, kind of... Um, like it's it's getting away with uh, on a technicality, 
Um, and I, I found that to be fairly troubling. Yeah, like it, it oversimplifies, um, it oversimplifies the kinds of information that could be used to like, cause we, you know, we, we're talking, a lot of people talk about identity and what identity means. And part of someone's identity is, is is what they watch and what they read and like it's not just their name or th their birth date it's it's their behavior it's th like there's tons of companies that are you know you could you could never use your real name ever in the process of you know whatever you're doing on the internet but if you're following a particular pattern that can be used to identify you that's like a lot that's what a lot of companies do now it's more useful to them to watch what you do and look at what you like than it is to know about you in terms of like a legal identity so i like i, I agree that it's disingenuous because if they actually believe that then then they're definitely not in a position to be making any kind of moral decision about who should get access to what they're building because they're they're going to they're going to put a lot I mean they're already doing that but they're going to put a lot of people in danger if they're that naive you are what you do is a good way of summing that up um, and I think there are uh, bigger philosophical issues that we need to address economically because I think a lot of us have gone in to this uh, internet technology um, really without a full appreciation for the value of personally identifiable information and before we had these digital recording technologies there have long since been anxieties at the top level of thinking about the impact of record keeping. And yeah, Plato also in the dialogues talked about, you know, the curse of writing and whether it would put pay to the, the, the memory and, you know, the, the mental dexterity of, of thinkers that if they wrote everything down, they would become lazy and they would outsource everything to tablet. Well, we're kind of in that situation now where we're outsourcing everything to the network and we put all our memories on the internet. And I think it can't just be trivialized as like, well, what right they have, they have to take our personal information. We're sort of coming to a conscious realization that our actions are in fact our identity and who really owns it? Am I allowed to just keep my experiences? Are they mine? Do they belong to me at all? What right do I have to prevent other people from knowing who I am anyway? Right, these are these are just issues that I think we're walking into in an unthinking way. And I think that's why this technology is important. Because actually it's kind of a radical conservatism where you're actually trying to preserve what existed before in the existence of new technologies, with new capabilities. Uh, and one, Bit one Bitcoin related example of this um, is the work that um, I think her name is pronounced Amidi that she's doing with uh, trying to bring more um, node privacy or network privacy in terms of uh, trying to make it not so obvious uh, that a particular node is the origin of a transaction when it engages in rebroadcasting because at the moment or at least up until recently um, it was the case that you know, it, it, a very simple thing, you know, you just want to, you've broadcasted your transaction to the network and it hasn't been included in a block yet and so you need to you need to, you know, tell your peers about it again, because uh, or increase the chance that it's going to get included, and that kind of behavior, that really simple behavior of a node, can it, it like it's indicative of like who the origin is, because you're not going to get a node that's rebroadcasting other people's transactions as much as their the own. Clever privacy is just maybe even more difficult than blockchain level privacy. I wonder how. How many? How much percent of full nodes is run by NSA? Uh, I think we would be shocked, or or maybe I'm just paranoid. I don't know. I mean, I don't think you would really need to run a node from the NSA's point of view. You're just looking at the global network graph and snatching Bitcoin data and recording metadata like origin, time, like yada yada. So the de the debug, you know, I mean, blockchain.info and stuff, they, they, they preserve all those debug log files, right? And they centralize all that data. So, what, well, yeah, why wouldn't the CIA or the NSA be doing that? Also, I mean, there is no encryption on the in the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer yeah. protocol. That, that's kind of what I meant, is like, it's they just need to plug into actual, like, networks and just grab data as it's going. Like, it's right out in the open. 
But still, if you want to log like uh, which IP address um, broadcasted first a specific transaction from that, I think you need full nodes now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Bit BitPay, right? I mean, they all geographically locate their full nodes across different ge geographic locations, right, to collect that data to try and anticipate double spends and stuff. Yeah, but the the point I'm making from like the the global adversary level, you know, which is what the NSA is. Like they don't need to to run any of that. They have closets in the AT and T data center. They just go. Uh, Look, I'm grabbing okay. a copy of this. Like so. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't see a reason why that level of adversary would even get involved with running um, like civil operators in the network. That they, they can just literally map everything in real time. I mean, this problem is not that hard. It's a uh... Even with the most naive solution that you can think of, that everyone broadcasts his transaction to to block stream info where Tor, uh, even that can defeat that global passive adversary if you are broadcasting to their Tor onion address. You know, like like what what do you do? The only thing they can figure out is that uh, is that. Uh, Blockstream info broadcasted the transaction to the network, and yeah, and and you had some communication that they don't know what with Blockstream info, assuming all every single Tor nodes are are surveilled by them. It's, it's like you know, like this problem is not that hard, and there are practical solutions here. Yeah, I pretty much agree. Last time I had a look at it, but just as a side comment, so a, a year ago I was looking at uh, Lightning and, and wrote a, a paper about it. Um, last time I checked, I think uh, like 2 or 3% of Lightning nodes were using Tor. So even if it's... I absolutely agree. So this is a practical solution. Most likely Tor solves it, but uh, people just don't use it, like especially, for example, Lightning users. That is something that infuriates me to no end that every lightning application out there has not bundled and defaulted to tour use like it it really infuriates me when i sit and think about it and for example they have hard hard enough enough. problems to solve no but it's already supported it's uh it was it would have been less work to not allow uh public ips uh, so I, I think Shinobi's point is well taken. Two more things I wanted to mention is uh, BIP 21, uh, even though it doesn't provide authentication, so it is man in the middle uh, able, uh, it does protect against a global passive adversary by opportunistically encrypting. Uh, and I think it's unfortunate that that uh, BIP is kind of uh, uh, dead in the water, it seems. Um, and then uh, the other proposal uh, that is relevant here is uh, the Dandelion proposal, which um, has similar benefits to broadcasting to like a central node, like a block stream over Tor or something, but without the censorship resistance issue. So like if everybody brought through a block stream and block stream uh, turns out to be run by lizard people after all, uh, that's potentially a problem uh, if the lizard people also know to de-anonymize Tor. But uh, if there is peer-to-peer -peer protocol level privacy, uh, then uh, the uh, privacy model in Dandelion is um, very, very compelling, in my opinion. Uh, they, um, they have some beautiful analysis there about um, how uh, it, it's, it's an incredibly simple protocol uh, and yet they proved uh, analytically that it's uh, like uh, basically optimal uh, in terms of the ability of a Sybil node to figure out where the origins of a transaction are. Yeah, okay. okay. And, and Julia Fanti, Fanti are amazing. Yeah, Dandelion is a nice work. I just wanted to add here that now as if, as we are talking about privacy in general, like what the other misbelief I would like to kill in, in, in our communities, like uh, people take granted that if, if, the, if they are using layer two technologies, then they have privacy. Like this is just so false. And, and I, if I would be so happy if we could kill this misbelief. Yeah, there's a terrific talk by Claudia Diaz uh, at this, I think, in the last uh, Lightning Conference in Berlin or something. 
Um, I will, Shinobi, I will give you links to all of the stuff that I mentioned, so you can put it in the show notes. Sweet. Uh, I mean, Istvan had a Istvan had a research on Lightning privacy or something like that, and I, I'm not quite sure what it's about. Uh, maybe you could talk about it a little bit. Uh, is that okay, Shinobi? Yeah, I mean, if you want. to. I, uh, there was a paper which I really liked. It came out uh, three or four days ago. Uh, it's an archive. Um, and uh, what they did is they were using timing side channels uh, on Lightning and they could de-anonymize payment endpoints. It's amazing. Uh, so I, I'm, more, I'm more enthusiastic about this novel paper. Our paper basically was just highlighting the privacy issues on Lightning, but... Um, this this new paper really like the they can dynamize the majority of the payments. It's crazy uh, just by timing um, the negotiation of uh, payment path. So they time this uh, negotiation and they can confer uh, who are the endpoints and, and the senders. Like it's it's super crazy. I, I really like that uh, work. Oh, is that just like? It, is that just like applying a like heuristic doing something like looking at the length and the stagger of the decaying time lock and then just brute forcing potential um, paths in the global okay. network? Yep. I mean, it's not that big brute force, so, <laughs> but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yep. That sounds like a, a lot more privacy needs to get baked into um what is made publicly available in the graph or not. That's going to be a really interesting design space going forward the next five or 10 years. I think another thing that it's not, I mean, I think it might have already become a problem, but it'll become an even greater problem is like a lot of what chain analysis is, is pseudoscience that's been said over and over again. But when you're dealing with these more complex protocols that are supposed to enhance privacy that pseudoscience is not going to go away and in fact it might just get worse like how are you going to explain or is is anyone at these companies going to be motivated to explain like well this is just our prediction it's a probability because we actually don't we're not able to explain how this stuff works and they're not going to be able to explain how it works to you know regulators or law enforcement so you're just going to keep having this problem where the pseudoscience isn't going to go away and it might actually get worse that's a very good point uh there is no global oracle to verify your work against uh, as a blockchain analysis and 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 if you don't even like publish how you reached one conclusion then like you know there is no global oracle to verify your conclusions and you don't even tell how you did your conclusions so it's like uh, the, I, I was watching a talk uh, one of the tour developer roger um said something about something that i cannot recall correctly but it's about some three letter agency was talking with and they said that uh, 90 percent of uh, activity on the tor network is this kind of activity and they just took it as a well yeah you you have the data i don't have the data but a couple of uh, months later they started collecting the exact same data and turned out that that the that that was completely false and and that's when he realized that he has to like you know you have to collect some kind of data yourself otherwise uh, adversaries are just gonna come to you and lie anything that they want and you don't have any other that, that you you just have to believe them like if Shane Alizi says that this is happening on Wasabi transactions then then we have to believe them but they don't actually like prove it uh, it's 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 a it's quite a problematic thing you know like there's two aspects to this so the first is uh chain like transaction surveillance as a business model uh used by kyc 
or like other compliance uh, uh, businesses or businesses that need to meet compliance requirements. For them, it's mainly about um, cost reduction. If they try to do uh, like if they um, get all of the information about all the users uh, by uh, asking them uh, personal opens and asking for ID and so on and so forth, um, they can achieve the same goal of compliance while fully protecting everybody's individual privacy. Um, but uh, that's expensive. And they would much rather just these heuristics that let them uh, avoid the potential customers that might have anything to do with, you know, nefarious uh, transactions. Um, because it, it's just a cost-benefit analysis to them. And I think that that's one category of uh, very harmful and very chilling uh, transaction surveillance that creates this kind of panopticon-type uh, environment where, like, um, some exchanges, like, flat-out uh, confiscate uh uh, coins that come out of uh, coin joins, even though like you can always go and prove like here's a signature from my pre coin join key. I can prove to you my distinct history, and you can completely de anonymize me. I just want privacy from the rest of the world. Um, that to them is unacceptable because you may have been involved in some uh, 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 um, uh, like n n you know your. Uh, your coins are tainted, basically, which is a, a nonsensical concept. And then the other uh, kind of category uh, is uh, transaction surveillance uh, as sold to law enforcement agencies. And there I, I would hope that the, um, the bar for uh, what is considered evidence is higher. Um, but it's uh, also extremely dangerous if they use the same techniques and set legal precedents that interpret these kinds of things in ways that are inherently pseudoscientific. And uh, an interesting precedent for this was a, a court case uh, in the Netherlands, uh, I think from about two years ago, uh, where um, data from WalletExplorer.com was presented as evidence in uh, – uh, in the, the courts. The evidence, if I remember correctly, was not actually ever uh, used. Uh, like it was uh, brought up, but I think, I, I don't know the legal jargon here, but I think it was admitted or something like that. Um, and that's a very good thing because Wallet Explorer is like uh, completely out of date and relies on bad heuristics and is uh, the data is completely poisoned by uh, various uh, like, uh, bad clustering uh, heuristics uh, where like even the, the coin join bounty uh, transaction is uh, considered part of the Mount Gox and others uh, uh, like wallet, quote unquote, uh, because of excessive linkage. So th th there's these two like really perilous scenarios where like one is that people just normalize um, this panopticon, this like uh, feeling of constant surveillance and end up uh, censoring, self-censoring their own uh, like private activity. Uh, with regards to all these cryptocurrencies, and then they will do nothing re of value for the world. All they are is like this stupid casino. Uh, and then the other scenario is where you have uh, authoritarian governments um, that uh, draconically like enforce uh, 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 like their their arbitrary rules um, on the basis of this evidence, and that enforcement lends the evidence credibility even when it may not have anything to do with reality. Uh, and I think that the, this is the actual threat model that, that realistically most users face. It's not so much about uh, targeted surveillance by the NSA or something, because there's no real escaping um, that, that threat model. Um, it's, it's more that this will have a, a chilling and crippling effect on the entire ecosystem uh, if these business models continue to thrive. Yeah, and the other risk, which I don't know whether it's worse or not, but there there's a different kind of there's a different kind of conversation or presentation that you get from these chain analysis companies when like because Nopara was attending the webinars and I've looked at a few, you get a different picture of what they think they're capable of in the webinars and like certain reports than what you get in their marketing and what they're telling companies and what they're telling companies is that you must use our software like you know you must do this kind of compliance and so if you must do this well you know we can help you with that and the reality is is that there is actually very little legal precedent to say that and like a lot of this compliance 
crap with chain analysis is necessary, or at least the extent that they do it. Um, and it also like they they know this because um, the, also the way they present like privacy enhancing techniques and also privacy coins. Um, there was one where that was highlighted recently where I think it was chain analysis where they had this graph of like um, characteristics or in, I don't know what the correct word to use, but um, one of, one of the, uh, the items in the chart was, is this, is this risky? And another one was, um, is this inherently uh, nefarious or illegal or something like that? Like, is it indicative of crime? And for all like privacy coins and coin joins and mixing, all of them were X'd out as not being inherently um, indicative of criminality. Um, they were just all marked as potentially risky, which is not the kind of, like, that's a very important thing because that's not the kind of thing that they're telling their clients. They're telling their clients that they should assume that there is that there is crimin potential criminality involved or that it, in some cases they should just treat it as being inherently criminal because they can't tell. So what they do in practice and what they're talking about is very different than what they're they're trying to get their clients to believe. Yeah. They're trying to create the need for their services. Like they're, they're trying to just create their own market, which realistically, if the reality of these tools and the, the heuristics and logic behind them were known, um, would implode on itself. It presents a kind of moral dilemma as well. Like if you use, overt techniques like coin joins, you're gaining privacy uh, in a very specific sense, which is that you're identifying yourself and your transactions as a user of privacy enhancing technologies, but with some privacy, like uh, plausible deniability uh, about your history. This is very different than covert techniques. Um, and I think that that presents a kind of uh, prisoner's dilemma to users as well, which is like nobody wants to be the first to identify themselves as using these techniques. If they are completely normalized, because this is all cryptographic and you know permanently available forever, you can always go back and prove, right, if, if there is a compliance reason that you need to demonstrate where your coins came from, like the travel rule or whatever, you can always do that. Um, the question is, uh, like, un it's it's very unfortunate that it's the default that we kind of do that uh, and that, like Nopara said earlier, that the heuristics actually seem to work in practice uh, in the sense that, um, uh, like, because these heuristics exist, all these covert techniques uh, are potentially uh, going to incriminate you um, unfairly. So, for example, if you coin swap with a, a, a darknet market dealer or something, uh, and they gain your like clean exchange tokens associated with your identity and go on to uh, uh, commit crimes with them, and you then go and try and deposit their coins on an exchange and then get banned, and then the cops visit you at home or something, uh, that's a very unfortunate outcome. Uh, but uh, and, and, and it's uh, like a hazard for individual users of these techniques. Uh, and th so there needs to be some sort of critical mass, um, like a, a, a critical mass of adoption for every one of these techniques, both overt and covert, uh, for there to actually be uh, privacy in practice. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to look at um, look at the, the overt, overt, covert, the, the covert techniques, uh, in 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 the case when when you are the criminal yourself and you want to use them then contrary to what you might think that oh if i have like a 50 percent chance that uh the coin that i get is is uh dirty the, then then it it makes sense for me to 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 do these covert techniques because i also have 50 percent chance that the coin i get is so so called clean and and again like even with this language i'm legitimizing that that uh that uh, other that thinking but anyway so but the problem is that if you if you get a dirty coin and you send it to an exchange uh then 
they will ask cash questions and then now you will have to prove that hey that wasn't your coin and then you prove that wasn't your coin by exposing which coin was yours which was actually dirty in the first place so uh even as a it, it actually disincentivizes um people possessing dirty coins more than people possessing clean coins maybe i i don't know yeah and i for I sure just, i just wanted to mention um because earlier we talked about a platform that was um either blocking or taking uh people's coins if they thought they'd use coin join and that was BlockFi, and um i just find it like the fact that they had the data breach and they didn't really demonstrate enough transparency about that and the fact that they have subsequently they have literally hired uh, their new chief security officer is a former employee of not only the u.s government but also of palantir and palantir is uh the perfect example of one of these companies that tries to become a panopticon and ba basically the private version of the nsa and surveil as much as possible and try to learn about people as much as possible and also n not only that but they also act on that in a physical way um there was a very uh scary example with what they did when they were working well when they were or if they still are working with jp morgan where they were not only surveilling all of the company's emails and you know if someone came into work late or something or put a certain keyword in their email they would mark them as you know being a potential whistleblower um and so what the employees started doing is actually just inserting random garbage that wasn't true, um, whatever that was, into their emails and basically trying to trigger a response from the system because they knew that they were being surveilled. Uh, and I just, I, I find it so interesting that the company that is literally telling people don't use coin joins um, is a company that is very closely associated with people who want to become the the very thing that coin joins are trying to mitigate yeah i think i think you need to have like a, a cultural change like people need to understand that the reason so much is being tracked is because there are there are certain institutions that want to have control and you can you know really control someone and a large group of people by surveilling their every move and it's the legal distinction is uh, malum prohibitum that's as malum in say and i'm actually uh kind of quoting somebody that's actually a really good crypto lawyer um who who mentioned this before in a tweet i, I just i just found it i'll link it in a minute and the, the the point is that in law you know there are there are crimes that are evil in themselves i mean say i think i'm pronouncing that right and then there are there are just statutes and, and laws that are prohibited malum prohibitum right and so when we talk about like using the privacy technologies what we're talking about is malum prohibitum the, the, this thing is often prohibited or it's heavily incentivized to be prohibited. We're not saying that uh, mixing your coins or using privacy technologies is evil in and of itself. But the system, the legal system has determined that it should be prohibited or strongly, strongly discouraged in order to aid other law enforcement efforts. The actual act of the crime itself is what is evil. It's not that, that you're, the fact that you're using these privacy tools that makes it look legal, uh, illegal. But the like, if you're like a chain analysis firm, or even if you're you're an exchange. The, the chances of you being associated with criminality go up or at least perceivably go up if you're using these these privacy tools and i think there's a, a reputation of the the cryptocurrency industry that it is uh, criminogenic that it is conducive to produce criminal behavior and therefore they you know they have this heuristic but it this only um this power and this control only remains if people comply Right, like if the if the car dealer that you go to insists on seeing your passport and all your proof of address, even if he doesn't have to, and even if he feels like, well, I should do it because the government kind of wants me to to keep records, and maybe I want to help them out, maybe I want to go beyond the law and beyond what is actually required of me uh, in order to do this, because he wants to look like he's he's a good citizen then that creates a culture where citizens expect to have to produce their identity uh, at, at every turn, at every purchase. And then that creates a culture 
And I haven't really decided yet, you know, whether it's right or wrong that we try to influence people socially, if we try to nudge people in the direction of using more privacy advising tools. I've heard from other members of, of our community that actually you should just focus on yourself and, and leave everybody be. But I, I just thought I would drop that in there. I'll link to the tweet in the chat. You know, there is a, there is a technical solution to this social problem, though, that um, it, it's just the problem that who, like, People like open source developers don't want to write blockchain analysis software because they want to contribute to the world and not uh, not destroy it. But uh, you know, like just if you are an open source developer, just just write an open source blockchain analysis tool and showcase to the world that that like the thing that you could you could put there is a. Uh, you can showcase that 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 this is so many people would not be comfortable with the information that you would share there, right? So and and I think it's it's inevitable that either a data leak of uh, chain analysis, Oxstar or or, or or a blockchain analysis company could do that, but 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 uh, maybe. Maybe you don't have to wait for a data leak. You just write an open source blockchain or NZ software and showcase why privacy is important. I mean, the, it's not tools per se, but uh, research that does that and makes the point very clearly goes back all the way to 2011. Um, uh, so in a sense, like people have been, uh, uh, you know, sounding the alarm for uh, like almost a decade now. Um, and I, I think the main barrier there is, uh, the tyranny of convenience where it's just much easier to not learn about this stuff. It's much easier to use custodial wallets or light client wallets that reveal your, uh, like XPubs to servers or reveal, even if they only reveal the script hashes, like in Electrum's case, uh, they still, um, uh, associate, um, a real world identifier uh, with your transaction history. Um, and it's, um, so it, I, I would only object to the fact that this is like, I mean, you, your, your intuition is, is right in the sense that like, if people understand this and it's easy to demonstrate technically that it's possible, like maybe they would care, but you also need to make uh, privacy uh, usable and uh, convenient and cheap enough and so on and so forth. Imagine two textbooks and a label uh, and, and two labels. Uh, one of the label would be first name and you write right into the textbooks that nothing and the other is the last name and you write into the textbooks that much. And when you do that, then it gives back that how much money you have and who did you transact with in the past and when uh, in Bitcoin. Like, you know, that's what is showcasing. Writing a research paper is uh, not showcasing. You got something okay, so to add, I, uh, Istvan? I saw you try to get a word in. Yeah, so I really agree with Adam Nopara that it's kind of fundamental that we publish, that we, we showcase and ring the bell that cryptocurrency privacy is, is um, kind of non-existent in many coins. Uh, but on the other hand, um, like we are publishing too much, we are giving away too much. So maybe Western scientists should not publish that much uh, because everyone tries to be famous. But so my point is that it's kind of horrifying like just the kind of, kind uh, of uh fundamental uh, things out there and and uh analysis and the like they don't give away any knowledge they have so that's kind of horrifying but there's an asymmetry there right because they want information about everybody else but they want everyone else to be in the dark about them yeah you know that's uh my my girlfriend's father was 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 saying that if they don't share your information with you and you're sharing, you're writing code and sharing it and you share every information with them, that is, then that, that's not, not really, like, how, how can that even work? Like, why, why don't you keep the code to yourself? Uh, you know, like, this is how you know who's the good guys are. <laughs>
yeah there's, there, there's a really moral a, a fix to that i mean because it's like a three-sided asymmetry like not only are you dumping everything out there for a chain analysis company to learn from and refine from, but you implicitly on the other facet have to do that to build user trust. And, and there's a moral hazard there, which is like if we assume that all these chain analysis companies are competent, right? They're actually good at their jobs, which I don't think is necessarily a reasonable assumption because – um, like they are profit seeking. They don't care about science and, and facts. They care about selling this data. Uh, you might actually be unwittingly giving uh, power to uh, authoritarian regimes to target uh, journalists or dissenters or activists uh, in a way that was not uh, possible before. Uh, so, so I think it's um, like in, in publishing that kind of data, um, you might actually uh, unwittingly cause a significant amount of harm to like actual vulnerable people, um, which are technically vulnerable today, but are not yet being exploited. Yeah, you know, that's something that actually really worries me in the long term. Um, you know, most of the chain analysis stuff is just ridiculously simple heuristics. Um, I have not really seen any big data science people or deep learning people really look at this space and put a lot of time and effort into how can chain analysis um, optimize itself past the point of pseudoscience. And I think that's, you know, it's inevitable that one day that shift happens. Yep, yep, not yet, not yet. It will be coming soon. And another what? thing to keep in mind is that, like, the the real nefarious criminals, to them, high assurances of privacy are just a cost of business. Like, if, I mean, they do money laundering in the real world in the legacy system, right? They bribe the bankers, they use cash, they set up fake businesses, maybe like in crypto, they use, uh, you know, they stack different privacy chains on top of each other. Uh, normal users don't have the uh, the profit margins to be able to afford to protect their privacy in this way. Because uh, they, they don't have uh, as much of a cost to not gaining privacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one one interesting thing not related to Bitcoin is that um, with all the protests going on in the U.S., there's been an increase in uh, surveillance military aircraft being used. And obviously, a lot of people are trying to figure out, OK, well, who are who's operating these planes? What 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 are their flight patterns and stuff like that? And when you start trying to figure out who controls these planes you just get this giant list of weirdly named companies and so you're like okay that's weird and then when you try to get more information about okay who runs these companies it's like we can't tell you i'm sorry so it's like all these people there, there's some people who are wondering like you know anonymous companies are bad why do the government allow anonymous companies it's like they directly benefit from that like the the same they, they don't want normal people using it for personal privacy to like keep themselves safe um but they're willing to let you know the ultra wealthy use these mechanisms and they're willing to use them themselves because they can hide from public accountability yeah i mean privacy somebody... is is going to get weird and topsy turvy in terms of asymmetrical benefits and costs to people and just how that changes things with technology. We, we have some very negative conclusions here. <laughs> um, maybe, uh, are you guys familiar with David Friedman, the son of Milton Friedman? Um, not too in depth, but yeah. Because he thinks that, so so he wrote a book, uh, Future Imperfect, and, and there he's trying to to figure out which technologies, how, how they will evolve. And, and one of the principles is that if something is possible, then this is going to happen, probably. And, you know, end-to-end -end encryption is possible, anonymous money is possible, and and so so it's, it's, it's like 
this is going to happen in in some way and not the surveillance is the surveillance will not win the war in the cyberspace he thinks the surveillance will win the war in the meat space but uh, but that's another topic because because we know how to send messages to each other encrypting it to each other so it just it's just gonna happen don't don't you guys think then that- i mean yeah i think kind of along those same lines even without big entities like corporations and governments like surveilling meat space on a massive level um if those things disappear then individuals are going to do it on an individual level just because more responsibility is going to shift to them to protect themselves and their property so it's like no matter what like a real comprehensive idea of privacy in terms of your movements in meat space that's it's gone it's just a matter of what kind of or scale of surveillance of the physical world is going to happen imagine mosquito mosquito cameras <laughs> yeah i mean if i lived somewhere without a government provided police force um you know ostensibly willing to respond to protect my property you better believe my property is going to have cameras and surveillance all over the place and means for me to defend it because that's just how it is mm-hmm. so it's like yeah i mean i that's like we lost meat space um we don't have to lose uh the digital world yeah i i i think we can we can save it uh and it's not not as bad as people think i mean if you're if you're using facebook then even every person in this world knows that they they don't expect privacy so it's like they are they are sharing that privacy intentionally. They they giving up their privacy intentionally if they are using Facebook. No, it's 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 if if someone wants to, if I want to talk to you, then I I know how to talk to you without anyone else figuring out what we are talking about. Yeah, I mean, and that's just going to naturally happen the more that wrong think. Um, gets purged from all of these big platforms like people will just fall into that it's really it's a bittersweet thing like you just got to recognize that one way or another one battle is lost but you still have a chance to win a different one Mm -hmm. i think as as the technology consolidates and I'm not sure it's happening, but as it is consolidating, then finally developers will have the have the luxury of thinking about uh, <laughs> luxury things like privacy too, and and it's gonna get better, not 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 worse. It just we are in such an early phases that privacy is the last thing that you want to solve because because like there is. Uh, five million other problems that that your users are actually complaining about but but when 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 you you don't really have much more to do then then you're definitely going to do privacy and people i i, I don't know if i i ended up in this privacy bubble the last few years but i i feel like people are much more aware of their privacy it's 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 like everyone is getting more and more concerned and 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 more and more aware about privacy privacy problems that for example the big tech companies are are uh, creating for us and and i think it's going to the right direction but uh, we definitely have to have to fight for it and it's not going to happen by itself it's uh it's people are the ones who, who ensure that 
that the future is is good and 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 technology doesn't take care of itself uh, you you have to you have to do the work yourself mm -hmm. there's a great paper by it was an invited talk for uh, an, an IACR conference uh, i think in 2015 by uh uh, Philip Rogway, uh, the moral cra uh, character of cryptographic work, where he, he discusses this stuff with uh, many examples. Um, and I think fundamentally his point is that cryptography is kind of a lever for power. Uh, it's, a, it's a force equalizer uh, in the sense that you it gives you the ability to resist more than it gives you the ability like it's more of a defense than an attack uh you can use cryptography to defend an attack but like that's kind of independent whereas if you're trying to protect your own data um you know you just increase the security parameter and you can make it arbitrarily difficult for uh an almost unbounded adversary to be able to uh, learn your secrets and this kind of uh, asymmetry like he has this d delicious quote in there which is something like uh, 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 I think a quote of uh, Snowden no sorry um, I think it's uh, Julian Assange talking about yeah. uh, how the universe seems to kind of favor this asymmetry uh, and I, I and I think that's um, it, it's, it's a wonderful paper that um, just really discusses in depth uh, the the moral character of uh, cryptographic work. Um, highly recommended read. Yeah, there's a passage at the beginning of Cypherpunks where um, Assange talks about, encrypt he says the universe believes in encryption and it is easier to encrypt information than it is to decrypt it. Uh, we saw we could, we as in cypherpunks, uh, we could use this strange property to create the laws of a new world to abstract away our new platonic realm from its base, uh, underpinnings of satellites, undersea cables and their controllers to fortify our space beyond a, behind a cryptographic veil. To, to me, all this privacy work fundamentally has to do about um, power disparity in society. Like uh, some people, like Chris said earlier, uh, uh, have an uneven distribution of power uh, and try to use it to control and coerce other people. And that's just not a good world, in my opinion. It's, it's dehumanizing. Yeah, as well as um, that quote uh, from Assange there, I think I heard him in another interview, he, he summarized it as the, the universe favors privacy by default, that it, that it is knowable, but that we have to work to understand it and know it. It's a very, very, very good quote. There's another thing that Assange uh, said as well on, on a recording where he said that the, such is the um, accumulation of data on citizens through their, their tracking devices and phones and things. It's actually the militarization of civilian life is what we're seeing. And I think that's a really powerful insight. The now, when you couch it in those militaristic terms, what you guys are doing um, with all the, these coin joins and such is actually kind of an act of rebellion. Um, you're, you're actually the freedom fighters and you're actually the people that are trying to defend um, the civil liberties of, of people. And I think that's, I, I, my, my hope is we're the right side of history and that's how it'll be remembered. Yeah, I mean, like, cryptography is the ability, at least in the digital world and anything you can encapsulate in the digital world that interacts with the real world. Um, and just... Like, how, how the fuck do I put this? Um, like, actually instantiate your rights into protocols that are literally enforced by physics rather than the actions of men. Yeah, uh, in the words of uh, Sarah Jamie Lewis for the Open Privacy uh, Research Society, uh, speak math to power. Exactly. Well, I don't know. Shit. Um, anybody this has really been the have longest anything? Essay. Yeah, it, it has. But uh, you know, I, I don't want to kill it prematurely or anything. I mean, does anybody like have anything else they want to get into or say? Well, it's final thoughts, or, or it's not yet final thoughts. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, it's we're we're kind of starting to meander. But does anybody have anything they really want to go into, or uh, should we just let it meander out? No, I think that's good for me.
We should find some positive conclusion as uh, Nopar requested before. <laughs> okay, I can do that. So I think uh, it's quite an accomplishment that we have been able to work together on Wabi Sabi with Istvan, nothing much and me, because um, you guys might don't know, but Istvan is using a Mac, I'm using a Windows, and nothing much is using a Linux. and and we are still able to cooperate in for 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 the for the good of of everything for privacy so so yeah that's a <laughs> i hope that's a positive note to end with two of the three of you are horrible human beings which two, two, of, <laughs> two of us <laughs> which two i'll leave that it's... implicit um Is i also... go ahead uh, just a testament to the the power of the transparency of plain text formats. Yeah. yeah. If you ask me, Linux is not the good guy among these three. So I I, I don't know. I have a hard uh, stance on Linux, but yeah, not, let's not get into this. Okay, bootlicker. Mm -hmm. Um. So I have another positive note. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but um, Nopara, you years ago wrote a post about how we should start calling these privacy wallets clusterfuck wallets. <laughs> and I have always wanted a badge or sticker that combines that concept with an actual U.S. military badge that is titled Operation Enduring Clusterfuck. And so someone has actually recently made some stickers of that. <laughs> nice. Operation Clusterfuck wallet. Awesome. So I guess uh, Ishvan, uh, Chris, nothing much. You guys got any positive thoughts to end out with? Well, I would like to know uh, yeah, it, how non-technical people can get involved. I don't know if that could be like a, a closing thought for many of you guys. Just start learning about the consequences of your actions. Like, you don't have to take it too much deeper than that. I mean, if you're just a non-technical person, like, just think about what actions you take have negative consequences to your privacy and what actions you can take to improve that. And a very concrete action is to just start learning what, how this stuff works, like, step by step. We all started from nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Just as a short conclusion from my side, even though I sounded, I may sounded really negative and pessimistic during uh, this little uh, podcast. Currently, like I'm pretty sure we are doing good in terms of privacy. So I'm I, I'm pretty confident that like Wasabi provides um, fairly good um, privacy, but I just don't want ourselves to be lazy I, you know it's like a cat and mouse game so all i all i want to highlight is that also the, the other side will get better more and more heuristics wallet fingerprints will emerge so yeah we also need to improve on our part because i'm pretty sure that the channelists guys and all these other guys will improve on their part so yeah this well we just need to keep rolling and, and doing this uh, wabi sabi and wasabi thing Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just being realistic about all the work ahead, man. Like this, this is not a problem that is solved with a single patch. But I guess, like my my positive uh, note on that is like, as much as I I love to hate on humanity uh, so often. If you see my Twitter feed, it's pretty negative. Uh, I do fundamentally believe like all this privacy tech. Uh, and decentralization tech and stuff like that really does have the power to change the world for the better. Not because it's intrinsically like moral or good or anything. It's just because most people are. Most people do want positive some outcomes. They do want to create value for themselves and to others. Uh, and yeah, rent seeker is gonna seek rent, but like we 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 have the technology to make it harder for them so that they have diminishing returns and everybody can have nice things. But, you know, yeah, this has uh, been the longest special edition we've done in quite a while. And um, 
I am going to try my best to get all of the cited things sourced in the show notes. But yeah, I hope this was enjoyable for everybody. Uh, catch you later, punks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye.